um, the idea for today is that we're going to go through the very basic steps on how to put on a theater show, uh, the things you need to take into account from the moment you're picking your show to the writing process, the staging, rehearsals, and of course, what to consider the day of. Uh, this workshop is specifically aimed at teachers that are putting shows um, through the different levels in schools, but it's not for, it's not aimed for uh, professionals, if you know what I'm saying. We're all talking about students, right? So regular students, it doesn't matter what age they have. It's not about uh, professional performers. So that's sort of the goal here. Uh, I don't think it's going to be very long, but uh, I'm sorry, going to uh, go through the presentation and then you can ask questions. I'm going to open the chat. And if you have any special inquiries of what you are facing or any problems you need to solve. So the idea is that we all brainstorm them together. So now that you're here, thank you so much for, for participating. The first, the first thing I want to tell you is who I am. Maybe you know me, maybe you don't. But I am a drama teacher. That's what I do. That's what I like doing. Uh, I worked at different schools, institutions, putting on shows, uh, teaching drama, not putting on shows. I've also done some consulting from some schools that are opening their drama prog uh, programs, yes. And they are starting to build an arts uh, department. I've worked as a theater columnist at radio stations and online sort of magazines. I've also provide training for teachers and schools, everything in Argentina. And thanks to the pandemic, I've taught and I staged shows online for students in different parts of the world, which was an amazing experience. Let's, go, let's not go back there, but it was still an amazing experience to go over that. Okay, so the first thing that we're facing, we're picking a show, is picking the right show, right? And maybe you have an idea, but you're not sure how to expand the idea, or you're not sure how to pick the right idea for my students, right? So we're going to go over how to pick on, how to pick the right show for your class, for your students, for your school. So the first advice is be realistic. And what does this mean? You need to understand the size of the group you're teaching. It's not the same to put on a show with 20 students than with 200. And yes, there are 200, show, 200 people in a school show. So you need to be very conscious of how many kids you're going to have. Then you need to be aware of the age your, student ha your students have and if they are able to speak a lot or not speak a lot, if they are comfortable standing in front of others because they've been doing this for several years or it's their first time, you have to take into account their English level or their language level. It doesn't matter what language you're teaching. And something very important, is it compulsory or optional, right? Is it what we're doing, are, are we, a sort of making the students act or are they choosing this activity or this after school activity? And this will determine the level of enthusiasm and the willingness to participate within the show. So you, you need to assess everything before even having an idea, right? I cannot think, oh, I wanna do something about um, Greece or Greek theater if I'm teaching a class that has nothing to do with theater, they hate acting, and the school is forcing them to do this, right? It's not very engaging. Also, you need to be realistic about your resources, right? Before you even think of your, your idea or you even write your script, you need to think where you're going to perform this. Is it in a classroom? Is it on the playground? Is it in a very hot, sunny day outside? Is it gonna be in a theater? Is this theater small, big, right? You need to know where it's going to happen. You need to know if you have lights and sound equipment, 
Are you going to take your own laptop and pass the tracks? Or are they going to provide a sound tech that's going to do that for you? That's related with budget as well, right? Do I have the budget? Um, what sets do I have? And what do I mean by sets? Once you get on stage, it's a black box, hopefully. Some stages, especially at school, they're all white because uh, other sort of school presentations happen there. Or maybe the flag is in the background, right? So what are you facing? Can I take off the flag? Can I move it? Can I hang a curtain that's sparkly and has, uh, I don't know, a forest? Can I build a forest? Do I have the money for it? Do I have the people to do that? Um, so you have to be realistic about that. Do I have microphones? Do my students need to speak loud or will they have headsets? Are we gonna have hand microphones that we need to rehearse passing on? Are we gonna have a microphone for the entire class and we need to mark the X under it? Um, something also you have to take into consideration is who's in your team, who's working with you. To start with, you can't do this alone, you need help. It doesn't matter if you're teaching five students, you need help. You need someone to check them while they're changing as you are setting the sound, whatever, you need help. So who's gonna help you? Who's gonna be involved in your uh, team, right? And as I said before, do I have a sound tech? Do I have a light tech? Do I have a backstage crew? Do I have ushers sitting the people as they're entering the stage or the theater, right? So you need to take all that into consideration. Uh, budget is a very important part of taking this into consideration and being realistic. So your first question to whoever is above you is, how much money do I have? How much can I spend? And if they answer, if it's good enough, we'll pay, we'll pay for it. Then make sure you present whatever you need as in, this is good enough, right? Make sure you're selling whatever you need for them to pay. So overall, in order to pick the right show, you need to have all of these things into consideration. And I know it's a lot because sometimes we don't know where we will be performing. We don't know what budget we have. We don't know if we're gonna have mics or not. We don't, we don't know, right? So my advice is that if you have no clue, is to do everything as simple as possible because you can totally add things to it. But if you're thinking, oh, over here, we can have two people standing and on one side, it's gonna be the light red because he's the devil and on the other side, the light is going to be white because he's the angel. And then you don't have lights, your visual effects flops and you cannot uh, conquer that scene. So my advice is plan everything very simple and then can spice things up, right? Okay, also something very important. I don't, I, ah, class size, I talked about it. Like if you have a small class, you would have a small cast. So if you're thinking of characters, take that into consideration, right? You cannot have a show that has 20 characters. If you have 10 students, you're gonna drive crazy changing between scenes and so on. This is something very obvious, but sometimes overlooked. That That's why I'm sort of, saying it. The other thing to take into account while picking a show is knowing your audience, who you're performing for. And because we're teachers setting a show in a school context, we need to consider, is this show going to be performed in front of other students, parents, or will it be open to anyone, to the community, the neighborhood or whatever? So if it's only students, there are certain topics, themes, conversations you can't have. Plus the spoken language needs to be suitable for their um, age level or English level or language level, right? If you're performing sixth graders, are, if they're performing for kinder students, we cannot talk about Hamlet in a mature way, right? You need to make the adjust, adjustments for them to act in front of these students. If you're acting for parents or grandparents or family members, do they know the language? 
Do they know English if you're putting an English show? Do they know the story? Because it maybe if they don't know the language, they know the story and they they sort of get the flow, but maybe not even that because it's a very original, one of a kind story that nobody knows. <laughs> and if you're performing for the community, for the entire community, is this a marketing point for your school? Are they using the concert as a way or the play or the show as a way of selling who they are? Do you need to have a final message or a final lesson within your uh, show? Uh, do you need to cause an impact, right? So you need to assess this when you're picking your show. Who am I working with? What am I working with? Who am I showing this to? Who's my audience? Uh, moving on. Then once you have your idea and you picked your show, uh, you've decided on what to do. You need to start writing your script. And thank, thankfully, this year, that's a bit easier. And I'll explain that in a second. So how do we begin writing the script? And the script will either make you or break you. Why? If you plan it wrongly, your students will never catch up with the content, will never catch up with what you're expecting, and the show will have sort of a weird energy and the flow, it's not going to be engaging enough for the audience. So, as we said before, it should be written with the audience, the performers, and the resources in mind. But also, um, you should consider other things. For example, the English level or language level of your students. So, if their language level is low, you cannot write complicated words or sentences. And sometimes we get scripts, we get them online or we buy them somewhere. You need to adapt them because that's going to make you flop if you're expecting your students to learn the language, to get on stage, to act, not to be shy. That's too much. So you need to adapt them. The, the sentences and what they're saying, the dialogue, needs to be comfortable for them in order for them to express and move freely around the set, the stage, the place. Like if they feel uncomfortable with the language, you're gonna feel uncomfortable with everything else. So if your their English or language level is low, you need to adapt the sentences in order to make them appropriate for the level. That's point number one. Point number two, if they're young, they cannot memorize a lot, right? If you're teaching kinder students, maybe one, two lines, that's enough, not more, right? If you are, a, if you're teaching adolescents, maybe you can give them 20, 30 lines per student, right? That's not a problem. But if you're, the younger they get, the less lines you're supposed to be giving them. You have exceptions, of course. There are students that are really good at what they're doing and you can provide more lines to them. But generally speaking, the younger they are, the less they can memorize. Now, here's a trick that I use. If my students have a really hard time with the language, I make their uh, sentences a catchy, but not long. So they might be going, go, yeah, let's go, hooray, come on, sure, okay, did you hear? Like very short and, and very short and active and very engaging sentences, right? And I wouldn't give them, what do you think? Maybe that's too difficult for them with the nerves and, and being on stage and be, being self-conscious. Maybe that's even too much for them. So I make sort of this funny sentences, maybe they're echoing someone else, right? So that's for students that have a hard time with the language. Now for the little kids, kinder, first, second, and third grade also, what I do is when they take the script home and their parents are like, you need to know this, you're going to be performing, memorize everything, they're probably going to end up learning the lines. But in most cases, they won't remember or study who they are speaking after. So they know the lines individually, but they do not know the order they are speaking. 
So what I do is I make them speak every single time after the same person. So if I have student A, B, and C, that's the order, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, Y. Because after B spoke, I know I have to speak. I even, maybe I don't remember my line, but I know that it's my turn because B has just spoken, right? That's another trick I use with very young students. So it's not about A, A, B, A, C, B, C, A. No, it will drive them crazy. They will never remember when to speak. And you would be like, you, you, you. You don't want to be doing that. Like independence, right? You can do this by yourself. Um, another trick I use. So we talked about uh, making easy sentences for those students that struggle with the language. We talked about um, providing a set order for very young students. And also, you can, you can incorporate um, sentences, mini monologues, like two or three lines long, for those students that are really comfortable and they need sort of like that push. So don't be afraid to give them mini monologues. It's not like, oh, make it simple, make it short, make it quick, make it easy, right? No, there, we have, we all have one or two students in our classes that are very strong and they can really handle the nerves. So they can, they can get like a mini monologue with two or three lines. Don't be scared of that. So as I said before, we have the audience in mind, we have our students in mind, the performers, we have the resources in mind. We, you are gonna list all the characters. My strong suggestion is that you assign a character to each student. It doesn't matter if it's citizen Mark, citizen John, citizen Emily, give them a name. That will make them feel like they belong, right? Instead of giving them citizen one, citizen two, citizen three, give them a name, it doesn't matter, invent it. Um, so list the characters, uh, list the main events of your idea of your plot, and then decide where's the climax, where's the conflict, where's the tension scene, right? Mark it in your sort of events, and then you can add themes onto it, like if you are um, or you can even revolve the entire script around the theme. Like, let's say you are doing a show about superheroes saving the planet. So that could be your theme, but there has to be a conflict, a tension scene, a climax, and then sort of a happy ending to it. So you should do all of that before actually writing the dialogue, correct? It's not that I'm writing, oh, I, I got another character's idea. I put him in. No, you need to have the characters beforehand especially if you want every student to have one. And here's the nice part. Once you have your characters, the main events, you know what the conflict are, you have the themes, you can ask the chat to come up with the scenes for you, right? To write the dialogue. So you go, oh, dear chat, here's the list of all my characters. Can you create a short play for me? Or can you create a five scene uh, show based on the, these? And you list them, right? And it's easier. Then you adapt them, of course, with the tricks I gave you before. Okay. Oh, we already, we've, we've seen this, right? You've seen this? Yes? Okay, moving on. So, because that's all I was speaking about. <laughs> so, then we have our script, we have our dialogues, we have sort of um, rough copy of our scenes, then it's time to make it interesting. And this is the part I love the most. First of all, we have done snappers. Now, if you're teaching, teaching or um, managing or whatever with very young students, what I do is put one scene, one dance number, one scene, one dance number. Why? As I said before, like kinder five, first grade, they can handle maybe one, three sentences. And that is a very short show, right? It's very short. You don't want parents coming for 10 minutes. So by adding, by adding the dance numbers, you're making your show longer. You're helping the audience understand. And the songs you pick, the dance number, they don't need to move the plot forward. They don't need 
to make the story more interesting. They're just decorations, correct? And you might say, oh, I'm not a dance teacher. I'm a terrible dancer. That's fine. When I say dance numbers, you can use transitions. So let's say you set your students in three lines or two lines if you have two teachers helping you, for example. So line number one enters. They move forward, they move back, they leave. Num line number two enters, they move forward, they move back, they leave. Both line enters, they make a circle, they turn around, they leave. That's all, right? You don't need to tap dance or pirouette or anything like that, right? Dance numbers can be simple based on transitions. You can also add sound effects. And usually sound effects are a huge gag. They, they are a resource that helps the student laugh, the, student, the audience laugh. They help the audience engage with the show. They help students remember the order of the scenes and how they work. Oh, sorry, for older students, even uh, sixth graders and up, I usually do three scenes, one dance number. Three scenes, one dance number, if you're doing a musical. Um, so sound effects, what are they? So if they fall to a floor, put a sound effect of their butt hitting the floor, right? Even if the stage makes a natural sound, add the sound effect. I promise that it's going to make the show more entertaining and engaging, uh, especially with an audience that does not know the language. They might not know what happened because they don't understand what is being said, but they hear, oh, this was funny, right? I, I heard a bang, this was funny. Also, you can add music. And what's the difference between a dance number and a sound effect? Well, when you're adding music onto your script, it means you're gonna use it as a lave motive, that it means something repetitive that gives you an idea of personality or characteristics of a character. But also you can use the is you can use it to help your students. So for example, I we did a, a show about a rich family that had a butler that was very clumsy, and the rich family couldn't figure out what was happening in their house because things were broken and out of place and they couldn't understand. So every time the butler got in onto the stage we had background music happening uh, that was sort of clown-esque funny. And the, the guy that was performing as the, as the butler knew when he heard the sound and the music that it was his turn to be on stage. So when it was a, oh, clown, I need to get on, right? And it sort of set him into this atmosphere that was like, oh, I'm funny, I need to make people laugh because there's, a funny song happening at the same time. So you can use music to introduce characters, as I said before. You can even use music as a transition between one scene and another, like end of the scene, Butler breaks the vase, blackout. You add music and then the rich family appears watching the broken vase, for example. Then I, I added here, it said actions with no words. And this is something that people underestimate a lot, but it's essential. It's the core of theater. Basically, if you can communicate something without the words, don't use the words. They're not needed. So what could be actions with no words? So for example, I can, I can write on my script. The butler enters the living room. He's very tired. He lays on the couch and falls asleep. He starts snoring. That took 20 seconds. He didn't say, oh, I'm tired. I'm, bad. I'm going to the couch, right? We know he's tired. He's yawning. So those are actions with no words. Descriptions of what's happening on stage. He enters and lays on and falls asleep and starts snoring. So we have a sound effect of the snoring sound. We can even have the yawn. Uh, we can have his music, his clown-esque music, let's say. And then after the young, we can put the family enters. They're watching in, in with, they're watching really shocked how the butler is sleeping in their living room on their couch. So they walk around, they're tiptoeing around the couch, uh, trying to wake the butler up. They're making noises in order to see if he wakes up. Is there any dialogue there? No, there's not. 
There's only actions. And that could have taken like three, even five minutes if they're really good actors, right? So we're lengthening a show without the requirement of students learning lines, which is the most difficult part, or even adding dance numbers that you might not feel comfortable in teaching. So these are good tools to spice your script and to make it more engaging, fun, long. There's something about length though. Usually, so that you have an idea, one page is one minute long. Usually, like there are exceptions, of course. Don't ask that your students act for an amount of time that's larger than their age. So let's say if you're teaching kinder students, you cannot pretend only kinder five to do a 30 minute show. It's impossible, right? They get tired, they lose focus, they start doing whatever, like it's impossible. So if you only have K-5 doing show, make sure that there's something else happening so that they're not on stage for 30 minutes. They get bored. They even get bored backstage waiting for K-4, K-3. So don't, don't make it long just to make it long, correct? And maybe a sixth grader, because they're not used to acting, this is your first time putting on a show, they can do a 30 minute show, not an, a one hour long. And maybe you have sixth graders that have acted for like 10 years or they've done a show each year of their uh, primary school and they can do a one hour and a half show. It's depending on your group, right? Okay, so that's why I wrote, consider how much your actors can perform in order to plan the length. And as I said, one minute per page, like sort of. It depends if you have actions with no words, dance numbers, and so on. Okay, the next step is casting. You have your characters, you have your script. How do I pick the right student, right? My strongest suggestion is if this is a compulsory activity, as I said, first of all, as I said before, give, give each student a character. It doesn't matter if it's citizen, uh, citizen poor. It doesn't matter, like give them a name, like they need to, they cannot be just nothing, okay? Um, that's advice number one. My second advice is, I oh, blanked out. <laughs> My second advice is, um, we're gonna check what I wrote. Ah, yes, okay. So what's your energy? Maybe you have a student that's really good at speaking in front of others and they are very uh, aware of the way they speak. They have great pronunciation, but they have a low energy. So consider who you are giving the main characters to because it's not about how they speak, but what's their energy, their energy level. And a student that has a good energy level, even though they might be shy or a bit nervous, if their energy is good, they can move the plot forward. If their energy is bad, they won't be able to push through and complete the task, okay? Um, another important thing is, do they get along with others? And why is this important? This is a group thing, right? We're doing this all together. If this, if there is one person that's putting us down or putting someone else down, they're probably going to put you down and put the show down. So be very aware on what character you're giving this person. Sometimes, sometimes the best person for the character does not get the character because I need to compensate. So what I do, and this is my trick, based on my experience, is that I see who's the leader in each scene. Even if you have a main character, maybe somebody else is the leader. So let's say we have this show about say, superheroes saving the earth. And the first scene, the superheroes are talking about how they're out of a job. Maybe the main character is not really speaking out, but there's someone else complaining. So I'm thinking about who's the leader in each scene. And I assign that to the leaders in my class, correct? And maybe the main character is only leader in two or three scenes, but the rest of the scenes need another leader. 
So maybe that person that was really awesome and thought was going to get the main part gets a different part that requires that leadership. Um, something that uh, you will face, especially if you're teaching a compulsory uh, class, is that there's going to be students that don't want to get involved and students that don't want to participate. So I usually start from the top and from the beginning and say, okay, I sort of sense that you're not really involved. Are you going to stand up in front of others and perform? Sometimes I say, oh, I would like to, but I'm a bit shy. If they answer that, I know I can work with that. And sometimes they go, no, there's no way. There's no way to talk to my parents. So after talking to parents, because I need to go, the parents, some of the parents want their kids to participate even more than their kids. So after talking to their parents, I ask the students, how can you contribute? What's your contribution here? Are you gonna prom? Maybe they're telling lines in case someone forgets. Maybe they're in charge of lights or sound. Maybe it, they're in charge of telling the actors when to come on stage. It's your turn, it's your turn. Maybe they're the ones asking for silence backstage. I find them a position and I make them work. Nobody is sitting as an audience member. Nobody. Because it's contagious, right? He's sitting, I want to sit. No. Everyone works. Whatever you're doing, you're contributing to our main goal that's to put on a show. Um, and that's why I'm very clear, and I wrote this here, about expectations and the commitment I'm looking for. Uh, something I, I also do when casting is usually I assign a main role and a backup role. Why? During COVID, it drove me crazy because I had no idea if the entire cast was going to be there the day of the show. So I had backups for everything. And since then, it has worked very good. So let's say you are Citizen John, but you also have to know the, the, the lines from and the positions and the movements and everything Citizen Paul does. So you get your main, your, your character and your backup. And you should be completely aware of both. And how do you check that they know? What I do is there's one day, one random day, and they know this from the start. There's going to be a random day where we are all going to act as our backups. And I check, hmm, you're Pirulito's backup. What's happening? Oh, I didn't remember. I, I forgot to study uh, my backup character. Improvise. You need to move the story forward. You need to move the plot forward. See how you can solve it. Teamwork. Ask the person that holds that character as the main character to help you. And that's how I bring the group together. And sometimes it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it has nothing to do with uh, gender, right? Girls can be backups for boys and the other way around. Okay. So rehearsing. You have your script. You have your cast. You know where you're acting, hopefully. You know what resources you have. You start rehearsing. My main um, advice is that you lay out all, all your scenes, analyze if you can teach that scenes in one class or two, and sort of make a very rough schedule of how long it's going to take you to rehearse and put on all of those scenes. And what I do is I leave approximately two months before the show free. So my ideal situation is that I finish putting on the show two months before our uh, premiere. Two months before. Why? The last two months, I am rehearsing and focusing on technical, lights, sounds, costumes, props, problems that might appear. I am rehearsing nonstop and going through everything and not focusing on individual scenes or dance numbers rather than the flow of it and how to move from one scene to the other. And I leave two months for that. But there's always something that's happening. The World Cup or there's like a 
DC is going on and everyone gets sick and I have no students around or something always happens. So I usually leave that time in order to do that. The process in which I rehearse is my flat out. Do you know what a flat out is? So flat outs usually are readings of the scripts with no acting. So the first day I give them their script or I ask them to bring the script, uh, we sit, we sit. So it's more comfortable or in relay, and we read it. So they know who they are speaking after. I explain what's happening. So in this scene, I want you to be very loud and over the place and exaggerated. So they might write with a bunch of exaggerated mixture. So they know when they're learning the lines what I'm expecting from them. There's no acting involved. I check if there's a word that is too difficult for them and I need to practice or I need to change. I also check if I assigned the correct characters to the correct students. Hmm, you know what? After a flat out, I realized maybe we can change, you can change characters. So change the scripts. So I say, okay, we're going to read the script as a, as a tryout. It's not set in stone. This is a tryout. So we're doing the flat out. The next step after the flat, flat out is doing the blocking. And what we do is, Basically is, for example, next week I'm doing scene one. Everyone should know scene one by next week. Okay, characters from scene one, get on stage. And I say their lines and they go, first line, oh my God, look at the butler. You're going to say that in this corner and put them in the corner. The butler is going to be standing in the other corner. And when she says that, you run away. And we practice movement. I'm not checking that they know the lines. The optimal situation would be that they are script free and not with the script in hand, but the blocking is focused on movement, in which lines they're moving and from where to where, point A to B, on the stage, out of stage, into the stage, whatever. That's what blocking is about, assigning movements. The next rehearsal, right? They should be script free, they should know the lines, they should know where they are moving and which parts of the script. And then I ask them, or I provide the actions. And this is something very American. British, British people don't act like that. So, But I've sort of learned that it works really well with students. Why? Sometimes they go, oh, I don't know what to do. And they're like talking with their hands like this and doing tons of gestures that have nothing to do with the line. So I say, okay. What is this character doing during this scene, during this time? So the line say, oh, where is the butler? What is she doing? Asking, okay, ask, where is the butler? And we go, where is the butler? But we get rid of those gestures, right? Because we're focusing and living the action. Okay, I don't like asking. Can you think of something else? Maybe they're screaming. Okay, scream. Where is the butler? Where is the butler? Okay, perfect. I loved your contribution. Can anybody think of anything else? And they go like, mm, maybe he's complaining. Okay, let's complain. Where is the butler? Where is the butler? Perfect. So we are assigning actions to each line. Um, usually we do this all together, although one person is the one performing the actions. I go like, oh, I don't like that action. Can anybody think of any? Other actions, if I'm teaching really, really young students, I usually let them, like, let's say kinder four, I usually let them say the line as they want. And then I go like, oh, maybe you can do this more uh, big, whatever that feels for you. And they go, like, where is the butler? Oh, it worked. Perfect. You're very cute doing it. So let's stay there. So it depends on the age, right? You cannot ask for actions from a first grader. They have no idea what you're talking. Um, but so you can give directions on how to perform, oh, be more happy or whatever. And last but not least are run-throughs. And this is the two months I was talking about. Run-throughs are rehearsals that for all, from the beginning to the end of whatever you have staged. Maybe it's from scene two to scene six, from scene one to scene four, without stopping. Usually they're done to check the time. Uh, professional run-throughs are done to check how long 
the performances. But the idea of it is uh, for students to understand the flow. Like, let's say, oh, there's a pause here, the blackout is longer than I expected, or it's shorter, I need to change outfits quicker. Um, maybe, oh, I realized that it went by really fast. I couldn't enjoy it. Okay, take that into account for next time. So the idea of the run-through is to do everything we've done without stopping. And this is the time where I've, I'm, I'm trusting my students, right? I've taught them what I, I'm expecting from them uh, in each scene. So now I'm sort of focusing on the tech aspect of the show. Okay, the set needs to change in this blackout. I need to get the chair out uh, over here. Oh, the sound. I'm missing the sound. There's a light off, right? I'm focusing on the, test, the tech aspect during run-throughs. Um, something very important I do during blocking, I forgot to mention this, is that I ask my students to write on their scripts uh, the side that they are entering in each scene and where they're exiting. So they write, for example, scene two, entering through stage left. And blackout, I exit through stage right because in the next scene, I am entering on stage right. Um, if you're teaching kinder students, usually you're bringing them in and out with a teacher or you're trusting them. So please give them the same entrance and exit, the same side from them for them to ex enter and exit. Okay, and something very important about rehearsing is that you should also be rehearsing what's not seen. What is this? Silence. You should be rehearsing silence. Students need to know when they can speak and when they can't. You should be rehearsing behavior backstage, how to sit, how to peek. Should they be peeking? I can see you from here. You should mark the stage, for example. Uh, this is as far as you can go without being seen. If you step further than the line, your parents are going to see you. Um, Everything that's not seen, let's say, for example, if they need to enter and leave uh, through a specific side, or you need to enter and take out a table or a chair, practice what's not seen, how they're memorizing, uh, reading their lines on the side, what are they discussing, how are they changing mics, and passing on mics if they need to do that. Um, yeah, I think that's basically it. For, uh, rehearse even what's not seen from the start, from the blocking section, correct? That's why I never allow my students to sit um, as an audience. If I'm rehearsing scene two, everyone else needs to sit somewhere else, maybe on the sides or up front on the stage or backstage, but not as an audience, not on the chairs. Why? Because that sets them in a sort of talking, relaxing mood. And we're all working as a team. Okay, moving forward. Before the performance. And this is all up to you. First of all, make sure who's working with you. Are the teachers working with you? Do you have a tech person, a light person, a sound person? Make sure that everyone is there at your convenient time. So we arrive early to make sure that everything is there. So you might get there and say, oh, someone threw away the paper that I had, who had which mic, I can't find it, right? Get there early, make sure lights, sound, props are all where they are supposed to be. Check that your students are there. Some might be arriving late because their parents thought it was a great idea to take them to the first her style is to get a new her style for the show. No, please be here at time, on time. Greet your students and warm up. It doesn't matter what you do, even if it's a game, even if you're playing, but make them bond, make them look at each other, make them connect with a performance, make them connect with their characters, make them enjoy the space, right? Sometimes you're not allowed on stage until the end, the day of the performance. Make them walk around the room, ask them to look at the lights. You don't want them to lose focus during the performance, right? Especially with very young students, right? 
they get on stage and they go like, wow, no, no, you don't want that happening. So allow time for them to explore that beforehand and communicate with ushers, right? Tell them when they can open the room, where they can, when they can allow the audience in, communicate with the ushers. No, wait, don't let anybody in. We're still checking, checking sound, we're still checking microphones. And then memorizing lines. I added this at the end. I know this is a hard part and usually very complicated because we uh, drama teachers or teachers that are putting on shows have very limited time during the week to practice lines. So we're trusting that our students are learning these lines um, during the, uh, at home. So there are uh, like different strategies to, learn, to memorize lines. The first one is very easy, which is reading and repeating. Like I read, oh, where's the butler? Oh, where's the butler? Oh, where's the butler? And I'm repeating. The second strategy is to write, oh, where's the butler? And then I write it down, oh, where is the butler? It's not suitable for kindergarten students, of course. Then you can record the lines and make your students hear them, especially if they have a hard time pronouncing the words because they hear you like on repeat. It's easier. I did send tons of recordings of me speaking and saying the lines for very young students because I thought parents can play this in the car driving to school and parents can help their kids memorize the lines, right? No, no, it was, where is the butler? Repeat it, come on. Maybe you can ask your own students to record and hear. And the last strategy, which I like the most and it's more efficient for me, is to say your lines while doing something. And usually it works when that's something you're doing is very repetitive and monotonous. For example, we all know how to make our beds. So if you're making your bed, say the lines that sort of out or, or, or like sort of um, your body and your muscles have memory. And if they're repeating something that doesn't take any effort, the mind thinks differently. It's not something I invented, of course, right? This is like a proven technique. So. What we do in class, even, even before the flat out or the blocking, I, I, I maybe spend one class doing this, is I make them do jumping jacks or um, push-ups, or maybe they are, they are pushing each other with their hands, or where am I, here. Or maybe they are jumping or they are doing something that's very basic while saying the lines. So I go, where is the butler? And they're repeating while doing this physical motion or movement. Um, and I think that's it. Yes, we're done. So basically that's sort of a huge and very wide, range of ideas and sort of how to put on your show and to get an idea of how you can proceed with whatever you are facing at school. So if you have any questions, I, I think, so yeah, if you don't have any more questions, thank you very much for joining. I hope that it was useful. I hope that you stage wonderful theater and shows and that you invite me to watch them at, at your schools. So thank you very much. Have a lovely night and we'll talk, I hope soon. Bye-bye, thank you so much.